All right, I think we will get going. I see people trickling in. Welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, as you can see, we're gonna be talking about cleaning PFAS out of firefighting systems. And uh, we have fresh results for you. Um, what you see on the screen is, is basically a setup. We have uh, on the left, a fire truck, on the right, a foam trailer. Um, we will be showing you results for how effective we can effectively we can clean out both of these and some of the equipment we use, you see in the middle there. And Steve Pistol is, is standing there. He's one of our um, experienced field guys running, running this operation. Um, as a quick introduction, <clears throat> we're going to be showing you essentially some details of, of how you find out how to clean out a, a vehicle. Uh, in this picture, Steve is, is um, looking at the control panel on the side of the truck. And what we're showing you um, are results that show we can get at least 99.8% reduction in PFAS in the fluids circulating through these, these vehicles with, the, with our method of rinsing them out, cleaning them out on the inside. Um, and in addition to that, we generate a very small amount of waste. There's more than 2000 gallons of water running through the truck to clean it out, but at the end, the amount of waste that we produce um, will be less than a, a drum full or a barrel um, when you count both the AFFF that's drained and then the, the, uh, the flocculant that is made from the cleaning process. So hopefully you're interested in hearing about that um, because that's what the next 30 minutes or so will be about. We'll have about 30 minutes of, of talking and then room for questions 10 to 15 minutes at the end. If you have questions already, type them in uh, under the Q&A um, drop-down menu. Please don't use the chat. That's more for technical issues. But if you use Q&A, we will check those and, and we will try to answer the questions. Um, and let's get going. We have two um, really, really experienced panelists uh, here. We have Rosa Gwynn from AECOM and Greg Knight from TRS. <clears throat> and uh, we'll start with you, Rosa if you don't mind telling a, a little bit about yourself and introducing um, what AFFF is and why we use it. Super, sure thing. So my name is Rosa Gwynn and I'm with AECOM. I'm AECOM's global PFAS technical leader. Uh, that doesn't mean that I know everything about firefighting vehicles. What that means is that I focus on PFAS, how we identify them, how we can resolve them and also um, how we, how we AECOM as a company can organize around, uh, you know, having our best technical capabilities uh, get across the PFAS question. So that, that's really my role in, in, uh, in AECOM. And I'm happy to have been working with TRS uh, on this project, although the real work got done by a group of other people at AECOM, including uh, my colleague, Ed Fonline, who was an essential portion of this, uh, of this effort. And he worked very closely with Greg and others. So yeah, so Gorm, thanks a lot for mentioning that we uh, have embarked on cleaning PFAS uh, related contamination out of firefighting vehicles. But let's take a moment to talk about why uh, the firefighting vehicles have PFAS in them. And then also uh, why it's important to, to remove the PFAS. So just very uh, directly, you know, the the firefighting vehicles um, often are uh, filled with a material called aqueous film forming foam, or AFFF, that was developed in the 1960s for use in putting out what's known as liquid pool fires. And uh, the US Department of Defense spearheaded this, and the Navy holds the military specification for AFFF. And it was really uh, uh, driven by the horrible potential for loss of life that it could occur. And, and one of the very notable incidents in the 1960s was the Forestall Fire. You can read about it on Wikipedia. And um, that's where the old fashioned protein foams were used uh, to fight that fire. And uh, it was uh, not as effective as, as hoped. And in fact, it resulted in a, a, just a tragic loss of life. Um, Obviously, sailors cannot leave uh, aircraft carriers uh, for their own safety. And, and so this is really a safety concern. Now, what happened was there was development of aqueous foam forming foam or AFFF, which contained a particular 
group of compounds that uh, act as surfactants, and the large class of compounds are known as PFAS, with one of the notable components of AFFF having been PFOS or PFOS. Um, <coughs> And you know, a demonstration of the incredible effectiveness of AFFF in these incidents is displayed on the right-hand side, where you know another crash ten years later uh, did not result in the tragic loss of life. And as I've said in the past, you know, AFFF has undoubtedly saved the lives of tens of thousands of people, or at least thousands of people. And yet here we are embarking on removing it from firefighting vehicles. So let's get on to why we want to do that. And Gorm, I think I addressed that in the next slide, um, where we talk about uh, just what are PFAS. At the most basic fundamental level, you can dive into this. You can give me a call. I can give you more information. It's a complicated and complex topic that's really actually sort of exciting. Uh, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And a perfluoral alkyl substances, substance is one that has a carbon chain that is fully fluorinated, and that's depicted in the molecule at the top on the right. And this molecule works really tremendously as a surfactant. And in fact, this is an image of what PFOS would look like at the molecular scale. Now, polyfluorinated uh, represents that some of the carbons are fluorinated, but not all, per all poly sum. And that's depicted at the bottom. You can see there's a different kind of characteristic to this compound where some of those carbons, which are the gray balls, have uh, hydrogens bonded to them. Those are depicted with the white balls. So what does it mean? Well, we've got thousands of PFAS that are all synthetic. They're all manufactured. Uh, they are tremendously resistant to degradation, especially the perfluorinated ones. That, that tail doesn't want to break down. They're really effective as, as surfactants because that tail is mostly not interested in having any uh, molecular activity with anybody else. But unfortunately, they're also very mobile and very persistent in the environment. And in fact, due to their widespread use, they've occurred in a lot of places where we don't want them, including our blood, your blood and my blood. 90%, 95% of the US population has measurable PFAS in their blood. It's kind of, kind of sobering, especially when you think that they're accumulative, they're found in human beings and in wildlife, and they also, some PFAS, for the few that we have good toxicological information on, can be toxic at extremely low concentrations. So here we are with this life-saving AFFF releasing uh, problematic compounds to the environment, and society is here balancing the two against the other, right? So uh, that's a strange audio uh, connection there for me. I don't know what's going on. But that, Gorm, for me, is the setup for why we want to remove the AFFF from the fire vehicles. Awesome. Thank you, Rosa. Um, so Greg, um, quick question for you. It sounds like AFFF is, is almost, with the PFAS and is almost like a, a soapy kind of thing. Why is it so difficult to remove out of firefighting systems? Well, the AFFF con concentrate is, is very thick and viscous. So it's, it's stored in uh, kind of in a concentrate tank on a fire truck. And then it's introduced with water to create the foam. So the actual concentrate is like this honey molasses type substance. It's very thick. And everywhere it goes, it leaves a film. So, um, you know, you remove the foam and you still have a film behind. So that film can also over time dry, becomes this flaky, semi-solid, um, think how, kind of like a pie crust. And these little solids start to develop in the corners and nooks and crannies and in your baffles and diffusers and this entire fire truck system where the foam is getting used. So it's very, like we said, it's persistent. Um, I think that's the best definition of PFAS in, in general. It's persistent. It's, you know, chemically and thermally just strong bond. It's, it's very hard to remove. Wow. Rosa, would you mind? Um, I know you've looked at, you know, you're always thinking about the customer and serving the customer, you know, more, more so than, than selling a product, right? Would you mind giving us a little overview of what are the options? out there for, for cleaning out this AFFF from these vehicles? 
Sure thing. So, you know, Australia has actually been uh, somewhat ahead of the United States and other countries in addressing the AFFF issue. And let me make a quick comment. Um, you know, AFFF was required to be in firefighting vehicles at, at uh, airports. Um, it, it had to be in there. Uh, so we know that uh, it's important that we had that material on hand. Now, as I said, in Australia, they're a little bit ahead of us. Uh, or at least taking strides faster than we are. And the standard there is to uh, rinse the fire vehicle uh, after draining the AFFF to rinse, the, and I think you have a picture of that, is to, is to rinse the vehicle uh, five times after that, which could potentially create five times, five times the volume of whatever tank you're cleaning uh, in wastewater. Now, of course, the fifth rinse hopefully would have extremely low concentrations, but as Greg mentioned, uh, it can be problematic if there's some sticky corners and edges and, and glued on spots. Uh, water is effective, but not perfectly effective. So what do you wanna do? You wanna get after that PFAS. You wanna make it more beneficial for that PFAS to leave the truck and get into solution than to stay on the truck, mm -hmm. right? From a sort of anthropomorphizing chemistry uh, perspective. So anyway, what do you do? What do you do? You've got to make the solution you put through the truck more attractive to PFAS so they will leave their home. And there are many people working on developing alternatives. And I'll tell you, the uh, US Department of Defense have, has developed and funded many studies into this area. And consultancies such as our own are super keen on finding places where we can um, improve the, the, uh, the efficiency the efficacy and the and the final product for removal beyond just rinsing with water. So uh, yeah, so this project that we worked on with TRS was really a nice opportunity to uh, benchmark a couple of those alternatives. And, and of course, uh, TRS had an alternative that tried to skin that cat, tried to say, how can we make it preferential using the least amount of water to get the PFAS off of those sticky surfaces. Is, is that fair, Greg? Is that a fair assessment? Yes, totally. Great, terrific. So what, what kind of tricks do we have up our sleeve? You know, We know that PFAS don't like to stick to um, lots of things. They function as surfactants, even though they themselves can be kind of gooey. Uh, so uh, especially in the form of AFFF, I should say AFFF and not PFAS. Um, so, you know, there you are, there you have it. You've got the sticky residue that you've got to get off the truck. And you also want to do it without generating, you know, five times the volume of the original tank that is necessitates expensive disposal. So there you have it. That's the problem set at hand. <clears throat> Greg, would you mind walking us through then, you know, your way of, of rinsing out or and treating these systems? Absolutely. Um, so I first, first as you mentioned, the product that we use for this, for cleaning AFFF out of firefighting vehicles, we use a, a product called Perflorad, and it was created and developed by Cornelison in Germany. Um, TRS is the exclusive licensee in North America for this product, so we're the only ones using it in North America. Um, Perflorad, it's basically a biodegradable active liquid. Um, it, it, it gets dosed into PFAS contaminated water and it creates icon, ionic bonds with the PFAS and then it creates flocks. Uh, so that's just you know quick version of how the perfluoride works. So what we do is um, you know we'll mobilize to a site, we'll bring out a mixing tank for a perfluoride solution, a couple sedimentation tanks, and then we'll bring out a, a simple skid with bag filters and liquid carbon vessels. So what we'll do, we'll create a perfluorad solution in this mixing reactor or mixing tank. And what we do is we basically run that perfluorad solution through the fire truck, through the AFFF storage tank, through the fire truck, through all the, the, the hoses and lines that have been impacted by the foam. Um, I will add that we, you, know, you have to remove the AFFF concentrate first and do a potable water rinse. That, that's kind of how we set our baselines. Uh, but once that's done, we come in, we run perfluorate through the truck, um, you know, exercise the uh, diffusers and um, try to get that all that perfluorate through every little nook and cranny. 
um, that process, you know, we, we, it's a recirculation loop. So it's running in and out of our reactor through the fire truck and back into the reactor. So we run that for anywhere from 90 minutes to three hours, depending on what we see in the quality of the water. And once that's done, we take the perfluorite solution, we send it over to a sedimentation tank. So then we take, uh, here's a video of the uh, perfluorad kind of, can, this is in the lab, but you can kind of see this perfluorad's added to some PFAS impacted water. And you can start to see those flocks forming. And then you can see the separation. So you can see that the perfluorad is latching onto those PFAS molecules and bounding them together. So what we do is we take that solution and we run it through the truck, run it to a sedimentation tank, and then we'll run uh, potable water rinse through the truck, same way that we did the perfluorad rinse. So it's, it's touching all the same things at the same way at the same time. Uh, length of time is not quite as long as a perfluorad rinse, and then we'll send that water back to the same sedimentation tank that the perfluorad solution is in. So we put those two solutions together to create our rinseate. Uh, we mix those again. Uh, thoroughly mix them so we can make sure that the contact time with perfluorad and any PFAS that's in the original rinseate or in the freshwater rinseate gets more time to commingle. Co um, after a little bit, 30, 60 minutes of stirring, we just let it sit and we let it settle. Settling takes anywhere from an hour to sometimes overnight, depending on what quality of water we're seeing. Um, and then that all that flock settles to the bottom of the tank. And so what you've got is got you, you've got a sludge that's basically created with perfluorad, PFAS molecules, PFAS substances, and then you've got a rinseate that's clear on top. We take that rinseate and that gets sent to through, through the bag filter and carbon that I sent, mentioned earlier. That gets sent through that for polish. And then the remaining sludge is isolated and sent to a, a drum for just storage ready for offsite disposal. Uh, so I apologize for the background noise. It sounds like there's contractors working. So that's basically, in a nutshell, the quick process, quick one, two, three of the process. Yeah, I've been, I've been in the meantime, I've just been showing the, the, the side of the truck where water runs in through some of these nozzles and you have valves and things, right? You exercise, all of that. As, so all the fluids run through the truck as if you were out fighting a fire and all the surface yeah. get rinsed. Yeah, we just focus on the foam bearing portions. So if it's yeah. only a, a, yeah. a system that runs fresh water, we don't get involved with that. We just run the perfluorad through the, the foam bearing components. I, I guess that's a great place to emphasize the importance of, of the knowledge base of firefighters and their knowledge of how their trucks function and how the materials flow through the truck. And you know yep. you, that that's that's not a consultant's job. That that's a fire professional's job. And I just thought I'd throw that in there because it's um, it's got to be a collaborative effort to to make this work. Yes. Typically, when we do a clean out, we ask that the the owner of the vehicles provide us with a qualified person. Um, you saw that slide earlier. The all the controls and valves and gauges. Um, you know, Joe Average on the street doesn't know what all those do. Um, we definitely don't want to damage equipment. So we ask for a qualified person to help us with that process and monitor things and make sure everything's working the way it should be. And we're not back pressure, creating any back pressures anywhere that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. Yeah. As an example, water could come from a fire hydrant into here and be running through the truck. And then there's a Venturi. And if you pull one of these handles up here, it'll open a Venturi and it'll drip, suck the foam concentrate through the Venturi and then it, you can spray foam, right? All of these things have to be done and, and exercised for us to get a good cleaning of the vehicle. Yeah. You, you mentioned the mixing tank, right? This is the recirculation tank where the perfluorad uh, solution goes in and out. Um, yeah. Remember we are TRS, we like things. How about this? What temperature do you need to for this to work the best? Uh the best temperature really when you make that perfluorite solution is about 100 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So think of it as if you were um, trying to clean bacon grease off a cookie sheet, cold water is not going to get you very far. So you need to have some heat to get that bacon grease to come loose from that cookie sheet. So it's kind of the same thinking, you know, the hotter the water helps move that perfluorite through. Yeah. Make contact with the AFFF, loosen up the AFFF. 
you know, you've got the agitation going from the, the recirculation loop and then you've got the heat. Yeah. And at the end of this, you generate flock, right? You mentioned the flocculation tank and then, and what are we looking at here? Yeah, so we're looking at here is a residual sludge uh, from our, you know, from our sedimentation process. So this is the kind of a liquidy mix of solids and water. Uh, you kind of drain it out and compile it into one drum. And over time, you can, you know, let that settle even further and you can still pull more water off the top. So we're always trying to minimize that amount of waste that we're generating. How much, how much do you make from a typical fire truck? Um, boy, it's hard to say um, <laughs> because it varies. Um, I think on average, when we did this demonstration last fall, we were looking at probably, you know, in a 55 gallon drum, there's about one or two inches per truck of generated solids at the bottom of a drum. Okay. So not a lot. Yeah. Five gallons or something like that. Okay. Probably a little less. Yeah. A little less than five gallons. Um, Rosa, I'm going to interject a question here that, that is, um, one of the um, Kristen has asked, why did the Aussies decide to to use five times rinse as an appropriate standard? Do you know the answer to that one? Uh, that's a that's almost a, a philosophical question. Um, uh, I I I think that it it was um, it was better than three. I think is part of the reason, right? Yeah. So the first rinses, the first flush, as it's called, is often very high concentration of, of PFAS in the, in the rinseate. And by the fifth go round, it's low enough. So it represents from a performance perspective, what they believe is, you know, well over 99.9% .9 removal of residues from the tank. Uh, that's a kind of a complicated question to answer, whether that's yeah. really the situation, yeah. uh, because the rinseate is not a measure of what could come out over time. Um, but no, that standard is, uh, it, it was uh, the, uh, the method of uh, trying and trying and trying and, and specifying what worked the best with a reasonable volume of wastewater to create it. Okay. All right, Greg, how clean did you manage to make these vehicles? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I need some graphs here. Um, so yeah, so looking at this graph, if you look at the concentrations, we have the starting concentrations on the left, uh, running along the back of the graph, the initial concentrations, and then you can see the final concentration. So the first rinse was, you know, basically sampled. So you had a first water rinse before we even applied perfluorat, and that's where you get your starting baseline concentrations. Um, we didn't use the same amount of rinses in each vehicle. We do anywhere from three to five rinses. Uh, but that last potable water rinse is what you see in the middle, or, or the, I guess on the right, the lower concentrations. Yeah, so we saw reductions greater than 99% in every, every case. And this is an all in micrograms per liter. Um, Greg, did you, did you emphasize the water reuse during the cleaning? I, I, I just think it's, a big enough deal that it, it's worth reiterating. I didn't actually. Um, for this demonstration, did last fall. We actually, at the client's request, we actually reused the rinse. So we did the first trailer, the trailer one here. We cleaned that vehicle with the perfluorad, and then the rinse that was finished at the end of product, we reused that rinse to clean the next trailer, the next truck, and we did that the whole way through. All five vehicles were cleaned. So our makeup water became our rinse. Our rinse became our makeup water. So we basically created this loop of reusing the same water over and over and over. That's how clean that rinse came. We were able to use it to clean the next vehicle down the line. So that saves some to makeup water costs and the, the generation of waste was really minimized in that respect. Yeah. There's a quick question also. <clears throat> um, why will will heating the water lead to volatilization of some of these chemicals? And the same same token, Greg. I know you're you're a big health and safety uh, expert. You know how come we can just do this in t-shirts and and stuff? Why is why are we not in in hazmat suits when these chemicals are so dangerous? 
PFAS doesn't volatilize at low temperatures. You will never see those temperatures in the, in the real world. Um, they have to be elevated to you know, greater than 300 degrees Celsius, I think, to volatilize. You know, Gorm, you probably know that answer better than I do, but it's a pretty high temperature. Um, so it, the only risk of PFAS is mobilizing is being, when it becomes aerated. So unless you're, you're, you, we put on respiratory protection when we're spray washing our tanks and stuff like that, but just watching water move from here and there, there's no real health and safety risk. Very so good. for example, you know, spraying foam, you know, it's aerated. You're getting, you know, exposing it out there. It's getting into the air. Yeah. Okay. So um, a big focus of this, these efforts ACOM and, and GRS have done, um, <clears throat> of course, have focused on creating less liquid waste, right? Because if we did mm -hmm. the same as the Australians, we would, <clears throat> we would use at least 2,000 gallons of water to clean one truck. And getting rid of that when it's PFAS laden um, can be very difficult and very expensive. Do, do you mind, Rosa, talking a little bit about um, other options? Now, we, we've, we've heard Greg talk about we use perfluorate to flocculate and we minimize the, the amount of, of waste and we make just a few gallons of this sludge. But what are other um, promising options for minimizing the waste and, uh, and how much PFAS actually has to leave a site where we've done this? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the... the uh... The uh, golden snitch, I think, is is a destructive technology for the uh, PFAS, especially concentrate in AFFF. Uh, there are many companies working towards a, a destructive solution. There's some concern about uh, incineration, which has been used pretty vigorously, uh, not just in the U.S. but abroad, uh, for AFFF waste disposal and other other PFAS related waste disposal. Um, AECOM, of course, is, you know, threw their hat into the ring several years ago, developing a destruction technology that we've dubbed defluoro. Um, I'm just going to tell you that's, that's not always the most fun word to have to type. Um, but yeah, so, you know, defluoro is focused on using electrochemical oxidation technology, um, using a specialty electrode to destroy the PFAS that one would find in the AFFF concentrate. Good or in the, um, and in the uh, first flush. So, um, oh, okay. <laughs> not quite sure what that is. Um, so, and in fact, we've deployed a, a pilot demonstration of defluoro uh, that is um, depicted here on the right-hand side. This is an Australian uh, effort with these totes full of first flush wastewater and had just terrific, terrific results. So spurred on by that, uh, we focused on doing something quite similar in the US and have embarked on that uh, as an additional test of a modified version of the defluoro technology. Um, I am gonna say that as a consultant, I recognize that there's almost never a one size fits all for the problem at hand. Uh, our, our job as consultants is find the best solution for the client's problem. This is one tool in the toolbox that would be made available for anyone to try on their site. And I think on the next slide, we have a little bit more of a show and tell about how we perceive defluoro fitting into the uh, universe of commercial destructive technologies. You know, defluoro would take a highly concentrated waste stream. Why would we do that? Well, you use the hammer for the toughest nail. Defluoro is the hammer for destroying the high concentration uh, waste streams. Uh, where we would like to make it sustainable, energy efficient, and at the end, uh, you know, there might be a point at which it's no longer relevant or most efficient to use the big hammer. You get very low concentrations, for example, coming out. Um, oh, that's animals. what we would animals. do there is yeah. uh, so is we would uh, okay. maybe recirculate the material or find another polishing methodology. So, and you can see we could deploy this in other ways, but what I really liked about it when we were thinking about these fire vehicles is, you know, everyone saw that first, uh, that first bit of material that was uh, coming out of the fire vehicle. Yeah, that it would be terrific to be able to uh, destroy that and not have to 
um, stored in a landfill or otherwise have to manage the waste stream for a long term. So yeah, you know, the idea of coupling these together is really sort of a terrific thought process for us. And uh, there are a lot of smart people out there, Gorm, I'm not gonna lie. And I think that they're also interested in solving this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, reading some questions that have been coming in, and there's some awesome ones there. Um, one of them one of them was uh, pretty quick. Um, it's probably for you, Greg. Can you also clean um, fixed fire suppression systems with this technology? Yes. Short answer. Yeah. So essentially, I mean, there's a lot of you know variables and what we can and cannot do, but yeah. Theoretically, it should could be possible. Yeah, because it's really just all about rinsing internal surfaces with a warm perfluorate solution, right? Getting agitation and flushing, and and those systems are you know not that different from the internals of a fire vehicle. They're just bigger typically. Yeah. Um, another one, Michael is asking: Has this been tested on all different types of AFFF? AR, mil spec, protein, regular foam, and so on. I don't think it's been tried on protein based foam, not to my knowledge. Maybe Cornelison has, but we haven't in the US. Um, yeah. I am not sure exactly of all the different foams that we've applied it to, if I'm being honest. Yeah. A lot of times the firemen don't know what's in the truck. Yeah. So how, <clears throat> there was a question about how, um, and it relates, it's from Ralph Johnson. He says, so Australia agencies just started rinsing your system five times and you're good. Um, no final testing necessary, question mark. How about in the States? Um, any type of final testing done and any type of certification of clean given at the end? Well, I, I certainly, okay. I certainly haven't that. seen a certification of clean. Uh, and I think in all fairness, uh, it, it's probably wise to say that we're on the ramp up into the solution. And before someone is ready to sign on to uh, uh, the perfect solution, I think there, that's the purpose of these types of activities. Uh, collecting those data, seeing what works the best, comparing what's in the market. And then I think you're going to start seeing uh, performance standards that are, that are highly defined and more structured. So I, I think the answer to that question is, in the US, we have not seen that yet. But it is coming, and fingers and toes crossed, that we can, that we can find a method that we, that we feel confident about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There's a lot of complexities, right? If for us to issue a certificate, we can definitely say, here's here's a stamp to put on the side of your truck that we cleaned it. Uh, however, each state would probably end up having different requirements, at least until for a while. You know, what would should the final rinse concentration be? What EPA method should you use even to, to analyze how much is in there? Should it be total PFAS by, 537 or, or, you know, even having a, a standardized <clears throat> goal is not present right now. So it's hard to, to issue certificates of completion. But I still think, Greg, maybe it's relevant to, to think about how much um, PFAS is actually would be released from, let's just pick one of the fire trucks you rent, you, you treated recently, based on these results and the final flush and analysis of both what was inside the foam tanks and what was inside the piping system, how much PFAS would be released uh, after the type of rinsing that, that you did compared to what used to be released when, when the AFFF was used? Uh, we're talking orders of magnitude. Um, I mean, it, it's, I mean, 99% reduction or more. That's quite a bit. Um, we kind of use an analogy. I think it kind of sums it up without getting too sciencey. Um, you know, we kind of figure there's approximately 7,000 firefighting trucks in the United States that are using foam. So if we clean 6,999 of those trucks, 
and we used it for floor ad. And then we reloaded those trucks with fluorine free foam. And then we took all 7,000 trucks out and we fought a fire at the same time and deployed the full payload of that foam from all 7,000 fire trucks. The 6,999 trucks that we cleaned would put out less PFAS than the one truck by itself. So it would take 6,999 trucks <laughs> to put release not even as much PFAS as one truck that's not cleaned. So there's an element of <clears throat> regulations has to maybe take into account, you know, you don't want to set the standard for cleaning them as drinking water in the last rinse, right? Because then, then it becomes financially very, very difficult to do this. And uh, then you would have to do it even more thoroughly than we did now, because you couldn't drink the water of the final rinse, right? It was around one microgram per liter total PFAS, maybe two and it should be 0 0.07 or so to be below groundwater standards. So it's not drinking water, but it is, yeah, more than 7,000 times cleaner than, than it used to be. Is that good enough? That becomes very important what regulations are getting adopted, right? Because right now we can, we can restore a vehicle uh, in one week or so, five days is all you, you, you keep a vehicle right for all these rinses. Yep. Um, and then it's back in service with without um, a triple F in it. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the key, really, to see you know how much PFAS is getting released to the environment, um, you know, it, through regular use, not versus you know how clean is clean. We could go, we I mean, we could spend a month recycling per fluoride through that truck, but the reality is, I don't think any firehouse in the nation can give up a truck for a month. Yeah, so it has to be practical. Go ahead, Rosa. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that I noticed that some of our, uh, uh, you know, tremendous consulting colleagues who have also been focusing on uh, removing firefighting foam from vehicles have chimed in uh, in the chat and elsewhere with some really, really excellent comments. So, you know, here we are spending an hour together um, on what really is, frankly, one of the more complicated topics uh, that, that could be tackled. And one of the questions that was raised was, you know, so so what, you know, you've measured um, some detectable or targeted PFAS uh, reductions, but what about all the non-targeted PFAS? And aren't there better methodologies for analyzing and testing? And I'm I'm going to say, yeah, hats off to you. The problem, as presented, however, is uh, removing the regulated PFAS concentrations, right? Uh, the when it when we enter into the realm of removing everything that has a moiety of a carbon fluorine pair, uh, that, that's a whole other ball of wax. And actually it's not currently driven by regulations to do that. No, toy, 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 it may be. Uh, so those questions are excellent questions and they do focus on what could be a more complicated methodology necessary for the certification, I think goes directly to an earlier question we had. What is it that we were trying to achieve? So what we were trying to achieve was reduction of measurable PFAS, uh, I'm sorry, regulated PFAS concentrations. Absolutely. If we want to reduce a whole bunch of other things, then we will measure those as well. So, and I don't disagree that total organic fluorine is a great way to do that, to kind of capture the whole mess. Um, but it just wasn't in the scope of this particular effort. So really terrific comments. Um, and good for those who are sort of more on the PFAS chemistry side to think about. Um, firefighters don't want to be hassled with these questions and that's for you know others to, to chase down and to continue to persist in. Um, but there was another question that I thought was really interesting and Greg, I'm hoping that you have some insight into this. And that was, you know, how, how do we know how the AFFF sticks into the nooks and crannies? And how do we know that the poor fluoride doesn't stick in those nooks and crannies, you know, once we flush it through? I thought it was a really great, you know, terrific question. And it's worth yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we do the best we can. I mean, we use the hot water, we use the recirculation loop, the agitation, the, the PTO from the truck itself to, to push water through. Um, the reality is until we can figure out a way to shrink people down and get in there with a little brush and toothbrush and clean it, you know, we're never going to be able to get it all. You know, we got what we could pull out, you know, 99% or greater. Um, 
based on our methodology of sampling. And that's the, the best we can do. But I, there's always going to be a little bit left. It's it's not 100%. Right. I, don't think I mean, there is a method out there that can do that. Yeah, but I, I do think there's an acknowledgement on the part of all of us who are talking today that there's more work to be done about understanding oh, yeah. where, what those tough uh, retained areas are and what they eventually do mean to future uh, uh, regulated PFAS compound releases from that very same fire, fire vehicle, right? So we're going to put another material into the fire vehicle, yeah. right? We're going to put something else in there. Yeah. Yeah. If it yeah. were just water, we have sort of an idea of what would happen soon after the clean out. Is there yeah. rebound? That's yeah. something to evaluate. Is there rebound if we put a different solution in there for, for uh, that's going to create foam? Yeah, right. Could, could, right. So right. could partitioning be heavily into that? Absolutely. These are all really terrific questions. And, mm -hmm. and part of what we're trying to balance in society I mean, one of the things that came up was, you know, do you, do you do this cleaning at the end of a fire vehicle's lifetime? And the answer is no, the whole hope is that we don't have to spend millions of dollars retrofitting the several thousand fire vehicles that you identified in the US, right? They're super valuable to yes. us. Uh, this is not a mothballing effort. This is a, a way that as a society we can balance balance the need for firefighting with, you know, the, these situations that have arisen from the use of AFFF. Um, yep. So, yeah. so the answer to the, one of the other questions is, no, we don't put AFFF back into these. This right. is when yeah. we stop use of AFFF, and then we go to a fluorine-free foam after these rinse, uh, rinse outs, right? And that's yeah. probably another one of the barriers is, mm -hmm. um, that the, the fluorine-free foams haven't quite been approved yet for use everywhere. And there are some really, really promising ones out there and some of them are better than others. But, but some clients are not doing this yet because they, they can't be sure that the new foam is actually approved. But that's happening very fast right now. Right? And, and so in some states you can, in other states it, it will be soon. Um, one thing I would I would like to add to the the thing where we can we do inspect the inside of these fire vehicles right and the absolute worst place to leave something untreated would be the foam tanks where in a typical municipal truck there might be 30 gallons of AFFF concentrate so that for instance we video inspect we run snake video cameras down and we look in the corners and the side walls and make sure there's no honey-like residue left, that would be similar to treating a site thermally and leaving bean apple behind. We definitely don't want to do that. Um, and where we can, we, we use video cameras to, to inspect. Yeah, that's a helpful tool to, to help evaluate, you know, how, how done is done. Um, you know, we start out, before we start flushing, we take a look with the camera and then take a look midway through and then at the end make sure and if it, we find more you know we, we do another flush it takes yeah john john anderson has an uh, interesting question how do, how do you ensure that the perfluorat flocks don't aggregate inside the truck um if pfas concentrate aggregates there why wouldn't the flock aggregate there well again it's talking about velocity of the water um, you know, if you're using the PTO from a fire truck, you're talking over 100 gallons per minute flow, usually I think greater than 120. So there's a, a great agitation going on. So there's not a lot of room to stick. And that's why we're hoping that we can get the AFFF off uh, that same process. And in the worst case scenario, if some perfluorate did find a place to settle and stick, it would break down. Um, less than a week, it'll break down. And the downside is it will release all the AFFF that was holding on to all the PFAS particles. Um, but the, the, the perfluorate itself is, is not harmful to fire equipment. I'm sure that question probably came up too. Yeah. 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 So there's a, a continued flurry of uh, commentary about different types of analytical work done uh, during this effort. And, uh, you know, it focused on the somewhat more complex topic that we hadn't gone into of, you know, uh, oxidizable precursors. In other words, you know, I mentioned there's these thousands of PFAS and 
And some of those indeed could transform into regulated PFAS. And I'd mentioned earlier, well, we, met, we measured against the regulated PFAS. So we also performed a top assay, which is uh, the current standard for looking at what those oxidizable precursors might be in the, in the waste stream. Um, again, it's uh, probably not the um, you know, full fluorine balance that everybody would love to have on this, but it's sort of a different objective. So I just wanted to make the comment that you know, in, this, in this situation, a very savvy client was capable of thinking beyond just the regulated PFAS and encouraged uh, the top assay measurement of the uh, waste streams. So um, are, are we uh, exactly where we need to be? No, work in progress, but uh, definitely um, not at the kindergarten level. Hmm. So very, very valuable comments. I think it's super important also to keep in mind that um, there, you know, we, we're talking about balance. We're talking about balancing the safety inherent to using these uh, really, really effective foam uh, fire suppressants in the saving of lives against the environmental impact of those, right? We're also looking at the uh, efficiency and the economics for anyone who does own fire suppression equipment, fire vehicles, uh, storage materials. Um, they need to decide whether it's cost effective to clean a, an item or to uh, dismantle portions that might be toughest to clean, but least expensive to replace, if that makes sense. So um, it's, a, it's a complex question. It's not just um, a tanks, tank that's shaped like a simple you know, cube inside a fire truck. It's uh, that, that must be rinsed. It's the, it's the valves, the, the other equipment. And, and some people have asked about suppression systems and built excuse me, in buildings and hangars and whatever. And some of those components are much easier to get at in buildings than they are in fire vehicles. So keep in mind that there is an option to remove and replace with something <clears throat> that never had PFAS uh, related AFFF in contact with it. So it's, um, you know, you, you think you got a simple answer. Um, really what you have is a very complex problem. Yeah. And Greg, maybe a final one for you. We're towards the end of, of uh, the plan time. Rebound, you know, we have a lot of, of um, what do you call it, parallels to the Dean Apple plume type of world, right? If you don't get all the Apple, you can get, you'll get rebound in the groundwater after you right. are in situ. What, what have we done or what can we do to be certain that, you know, after you release the, truck on Friday afternoon and you say now you've we've had you for four or five days now you can go back and service what can we do to or what have we done to have confidence that there isn't going to be a significant rebound in other words you do the final rinse you get the, the 500 gallons uh, going through the truck you sample it it's fine it's only like one micrograms per liter how do we know that a, a week later it's not 10 times or 100 times higher than that now that's the, that's the thing we're still learning. Um, you know, we reality is you, you release a truck, it needs to go back into service. And well, there's people's lives are at stake if the fire truck's not available. Yeah. Um, so rebound testing hasn't really been part of the, the what we've been able to provide at this point, but we are involved in some ESTCP studies that we're going to be doing some rebound testing on some uh, P19R vehicles. Um, so we'll have that data hopefully maybe in a year from now. Um, we're also doing, uh, TRS is doing a project uh, for a private customer uh, where rebound testing is part of the, the scope. So we'll have some data there. So we're still learning. Um, we don't have the data yet, but we're still working towards it to get an idea what rebound is. And, you know, it, it's weird because you have to look at it, you know, um, there's some, some test studies done where you're doing rebound testing where you're soaking in water um the reality is a foam tank isn't sitting with water in it it's got more foam or fluorine free foam so we had to kind of look at it from that perspective if we clean a, a fluorine foam out and then you put fluorine free foam in it what does the rebound look like in that case uh, we yeah. don't know yet there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to rebound it's really hard to to pinpoint you have to try to simulate real world scenarios and sometimes we get a little sidetracked <laughs> 
we look too much at you know oh let's just soak it in water for six months and see what happens yeah i guess the, so we're still I, learning the ideal test would be to pretend you go to a fire right you you bring your equipment out you you and you exercise the the engine through the mm -hmm. pto you you run water through and you actuate the venturis you spray as if you were putting out a fire you spray it into something like a cyclone or a big tank and then you sample that that is probably the only or the most direct measurement what's the pfas concentration in in that that would right. be basically going on the ground in a real fire situation yeah and so the question of how how long uh, yeah do you, yeah. do you let you know do you wait do you wait a week a month a year yeah those are questions that a lot of people are willing to answer. Yeah. So, so most fire trucks are not basically full of water in their pipes when they're not in service, right? So it's not like no. Though these internals and venturis that we just cleaned out are now sitting with water and what and PFAS diffusing. Yeah, it's not diffusing. Uh, no, they're drained um, after service. Right. You know, after use, they're drained. So you don't have water sitting in there. So nothing's diffusing. No. Uh, all the activity, rebound activity is occurring in the, the holding tank, really. In the foam tank. And in the in the venturi is where it leads into the water system. Uh, that's the only place really where the foam is, you know, has a chance to leach back out. And by visually inspecting them, that there's no napple, if you will, no AFFF concentrate left to dissolve into the new yeah. concentrate. That that gives us some confidence. Yeah. That whatever rebound there is should be a very small amount compared to yeah what yeah compared to just doing nothing yeah all right did you find any uh, more questions you wanted to answer from the list there's so many good ones there's so many i'm just looking at them now yeah well i will say that um you know when when i looked at some of the comments i i can just say and questions Absolutely, there is a hunger in the community for additional data, and uh, I'm part of that um, hungry part, portion of the community. This is an initial positive results that are just showing uh, uh, opportunity for us to take advantage, for society to do a little bit of a better job. Are more data needed? Uh, you bet, right? You bet. So we're all after that, and I think that's encouraging to hear someone say, yeah, I see your data, I'd like to see more. And it's like, yeah, so would we, we would love to see that. I know Greg would, I'm, um, you know, I'm participating on this because we, uh, you know, ventured out together on this particular project as a team, but uh, I'm sure that TRS is gonna head out and do a ton more of this work uh, with a whole bunch of other partners. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how much of that information you can share as soon as you can share, because, I think it's going to just inform the community at large. You know, what are our best fits? Is is this is this really going to be good, or are there some boundaries uh, uh, on which we need to consider? Uh, you know, where perfluoride is the first choice, or perfluoride might be the third choice. And uh, I'm not I'm not trying to cast aspersions on the good work that you're doing. I'm just trying to be a realist, or maybe I'm just at heart a consultant. And that is, yeah. there often is a variety of solutions. And yeah. we may just be on to something with this effort. So I, I, I think the community needs to know and needs to be able to try it. Yeah. And, and if nothing else, we, we have a good soap, right? We have a really good, the perfluoride is, is good at, a, at addressing PFAS that is in solution. And Ian Ross asked the question here saying, saying, it works on PFAS in solution. How do you know that it actually also works on the things that are stuck to the walls and vessels uh, inside the fire truck. There's definitely some, some of that. It also works a little bit as a solvent, right? And, it, and it's warm and it is slushing and agitated. And Greg, maybe you should be answering this, but- Yeah, uh, I, you know, one of the things that I didn't mention earlier, you know, we were adding the perfluorate solution to, the, to the, the foam tank, the storage tank. We're also, we create a little diffusion tree and a recirculation pump. You had a photo of it earlier with the little black pump with the green hoses. Um, so you can't see it, but going into the tank, there's a little diffusion there. So we're shooting water, recirculating that perfluorite solution against the walls and the bottom and the top of that, that tank, because they're not accessible. Um, and this one you're looking at, it's a four inch square 
uh, access port and then you're looking down basically a two inch pipe. So we had to build a custom diffuser for every truck almost mm -hmm. to try to agitate those walls and try to knock the, any of those dry, crusty AFFF that's stuck on the top of the tank, um, you know, to knock that stuff loose. Mm -hmm. um, to give you an example, so the three trucks we did on this demonstration, one was full, one was half full and one was empty. And one had been empty for a while. Um, so there was all different kind of scenarios where we had to try to to try to accommodate, you know, loosening that stuff free that had been there and air dry for time. And here um, you can see you can see stuff that's been knocked knocked loose right from the edge. Yeah. And it's not just uh, aqueous chemistry going on. It, it's I think if nothing else, we we are also doing our best to build a, the right washing machine, right? Or a dishwasher. A dishwasher needs to be able to heat the water, add the soap and agitate and get all the surfaces uh, exposed to the warm, yeah. soapy water. Um, I'm sure perfluorite is, will be 10 years from now, we'll be using something even better, right? We'll improve on it and others will come up with better solutions. However, the mechanics of understanding a fire truck and getting it right is not going to change. That, that uh, dishwashing machine and the knowledge you have to build around it is, is going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. thank you so much, both of you. And thank you for all the amazing questions. Um, time is up. If if any of you who asked a question is sitting out there going, ah, you ignored my question. It, it was not on purpose. Please send an email if if that happened, if you don't mind. And then we will 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 um, get a question or get answers or explanations together for those questions you felt were not observed or ignored. It was definitely not on purpose. There, there was quite a few of them to yeah. uh, to handle during the call. So thank you everybody for for being with us. Oh yeah, shameless plug. You know, aflf.com. That's TRS's website for the AFFF cleanouts. If you need more information, that's probably the best place to go. Again, it's the letter A, the word triple spelled out, and then letter F.com. Very. Thank you. Thank you.